Good morning, everyone. Welcome to session four of our series of five regional webinars this summer. I'm Kate Rowley, Senior Her Majesty's Inspector in the North East Yorkshire and Humber region. Last week, we heard from our curriculum unit leads, Heather and Jonathan, about planning an effective curriculum. And I'm really delighted today to be joined by two of our curriculum unit subject leaders. I'll hand over and let them introduce themselves as well as our other colleagues too. Morning, everyone. My name is Michael Wardle. Um, I'm an HMI in the North East Yorkshire and Humber region based in Newcastle, and I'm the subject lead for languages. Morning, everyone. My name's Tim Jenner. I am HMI in the North East Yorkshire and Humber region, and I'm also the subject lead for history. Morning, everybody. I'm Kirsty Godfrey, also one of Her Majesty's inspectors in the North East Yorkshire Humber region, and also Ofsted subject lead for early reading. And finally, good morning, everybody, from me. My name's Emma Ng. I'm the regional director here in the North East Yorkshire and Humber. And I'm delighted to join my colleague Kate and others in welcoming you all to this fascinating session uh, on building a curriculum in two specific subjects in the primary sector. Now, the aim of this, it's building on previous webinars, is very much to model how you might do it in two subjects so that you can take that away and think about how you might do it in other subjects as well. I've attended the first version of session four earlier this week, and because like you all, I'm a busy person, I'm going to leave you to it for the rest of the morning. But I do welcome you hugely. I do thank my colleagues, both uh, on stage and behind stage, uh, for preparing this for you and wish you a very happy morning. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. So Tim and Michael are going to cover um, the content in, in most of the session today for us around languages and history. And then we will have some time at the end to pick up some questions. Now we have some questions that have come in to us before the session, um, which we'll answer. But please feel free, free throughout the session just to type a question into the bar um, if you want to ask something of Michael or Tim at the end, particularly around history and languages today. But also we've got Kirsty here who can answer any reading questions. And if you want to ask any questions about the wider curriculum and the inspection education framework we're really happy to give you the opportunity to ask those questions now too. If you do have any technical difficulties in the session today if you pop again a note in the question bar Andrea who is supporting us in the background um, will try and resolve that for you. So here we are then looking at where we are in our series of webinars at session four. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Michael and Tim to talk to us about languages and history. So morning, everyone. Our aim today, as you have heard, is to build on the principles of curriculum design and curriculum sequencing which have been covered in the previous webinars. These have made clear the importance of a well-planned, carefully sequenced curriculum, which ensures that pupils make progress by building their knowledge and building their understanding. And this draws upon uh, two examples of uh, two key aspects of the good criteria for the quality of education. And we're going to explore the implications of these principles in two subjects, as you've heard, in languages and history. And we hope to, this will be helpful in two ways. Firstly, to exemplify some of the principles in a subject specific way, which we hope will make them clearer. But secondly, there are important differences between these two subjects. And so we will want to consider how these principles um, might need to be applied slightly differently in different subjects. So the structure of the session is as follows. I will talk us through some of the most important things to consider when approaching the sequencing of the curriculum in languages. And Tim will then do the same for history. And at the end, we will draw out some of the key principles for curriculum design, which are common across many subjects, as well as highlighting a few areas where subjects might require a slightly different emphasis or a slightly different approach. And we're using history and languages as our examples. So firstly then, let us turn our thoughts to curriculum planning in languages. What does progression and sequencing look like in languages? Pupils in classrooms do not learn a language the way that we did as a toddler. 
Natural acquisition as a toddler includes extensive exposure to the language. There is a full and complete immersion in the language for toddlers. Essentially, as we grow up, our survival depends on developing language and it's, it's fairly high stakes. Learning our first language is largely unconscious. Now it's argued that the capacity to learn a language like this, in that, in that unconscious way, changes over time. The older we get, the less language seeps into our consciousness simply by being surrounded by it, although the extent to which that is the case is debated. But most importantly for us this morning is that pupils in classrooms will not simply pick up a language by osmosis. Teachers speaking in the target language and expecting pupils to pick up meanings, to pick up rules by inference in languages is not effective and it is not efficient. Learning a language in a UK classroom where maximum arguably there's one hour per week uh, language learning in, in primary schools and maximum three hours per week at secondary schools, this cannot replicate how we learned our first language, even if some researchers believe it to be technically possible. So, given this, we need to have a curriculum that is sequenced well, that helps pupils to make connections in their head, and to help pupils understand what is going on in the language, and a curriculum that helps pupils to keep up and that holes do not start appearing in their knowledge and in their language learning. So it's important to recognise that it is likely in languages in a UK context that this is not just picked up or absorbed unconsciously, it's more likely to be formally learned through conscious and deliberate planning of curriculum in, uh, in terms of content and in terms of systematic teaching and reinforcement of ideas. Once we understand and accept this, the next logical question has to be about what the components or the building blocks actually are. A building block, a basic unit, so a word, a pronunciation or spelling rule, a foundational grammatical principle. These basic uh, building blocks of language uh, which can be clearly understood and used again and used again in multiple and different contexts. So, what are the aspects of learning for curriculum purposes? Phonics, the link between phonemes and graphemes. A phoneme, as you know, is a, a meaning-bearing sound of a language. Uh, you will know this as primary specialists teaching phonics. But of course, different languages have different phoneme and grapheme correspondences. And indeed, they also have different phonemes. So as an example, um, if you think about the, the letter L in your head, or either say this out loud or in your head, if you say the word light, and then say the word whole, light, whole, we actually in English have two types of L, one at the front, one at the back, light and whole. If you use the wrong one in English, it doesn't change meaning. If you use a light L, a front L instead of a dark L for whole, for example, so instead of saying whole, you say whole, it can sound quite Geordie. But actually in Polish, this differentiates meaning. Laska and laska uh, being walking stick or favour. Bring it closer to home, perhaps to the primary languages classroom, you'll be aware that French has um, two sounds, U and U. And for tu and tu, we have different meanings in French. But in our minds, we may only hear one phoneme. Uh, it's just that it might be changing the sound from uh, English to Scottish, you, you. So phonics, the link between phonemes and graphemes, which is specific to the language being studied. Vocabulary, the lexicon, the lexical items and the words, and some grammatical information about those words. In different languages, there may be a gender, different plural forms and the like. And grammar, the rules for combining words to make universally understood meaning. So how words, especially verbs, change to convey meaning is very important. Of course, it's how these pillars interlink that help us to produce and to understand language. Even at a basic level, 
in the primary curriculum, a simple noun. Pupils need to know how to pronounce it. They need to know what the gender is. They need to know how it combines with other words in a sentence. And all through the process of language learning, it is the skill of bringing these parts together, the phonics, the grammar and the vocabulary. And this is the most important part in, able to be, in order to be able to understand or produce language. Nonetheless, these three pillars are helpful to us. And for some languages, if some uh, colleagues uh, on the call um, are teaching Mandarin, uh, there is an additional pillar of script, as in some languages, the script is not linked to uh, the uh, phonology. So pillars of progression, phonics, grammar and vocabulary, and how these interplay to be able to understand and produce language. Progression or pillars of progression in languages are not speaking, listening, reading and writing. These are technically modalities. They are where language exists. So we can understand language, either in its written or spoken form, so by reading and listening, and we can produce language, either in its written or spoken form, that would be uh, writing and speaking. To be able to speak and write in the target language, what one needs is more words and more grammatical structures. To understand more spoken and written language, you need a deeper appreciation of the sound spelling link, the phoneme grapheme correspondence, where words start and where words finish when you're hearing them. And you need to know more words and you need to understand more structures. So the pillars of progression are not simply along the axis of speaking, listening, reading and writing. You need to know and be able to apply more phonic knowledge, grammar knowledge or grammatical knowledge and knowledge of the lexicon. Neither are pillars of progression in languages topics. Simply knowing more words about different things will not allow you to become more proficient in using or understanding the language. Arguably, you simply become more like a dictionary in that sense. So pillars of progression are not topics alone. And neither are pillars of progression learning more and more rehearsed question and answer pairs. This is useful at some point, but on one level, it only makes the learner not into a dictionary at that point, but into a phrase book. Stripping all of this back, having the tools to generate and understand simple language is at the heart of a strong languages curriculum. There may well be listening, speaking, reading and writing in, in, in lessons. There may well be rehearsed questions and answers where they are useful, but pupils need to know the building blocks of the language. And as I've said, that would be thinking carefully or curriculum plans, thinking carefully about how the language is pronounced and how this links with spelling. We need to think carefully about the words that we choose to teach and why, how and when they're introduced and why, when they're revisited and why. And think carefully about simple grammar in, in primary schools, how this builds step by step in the mind of the learner. So let's have a look at a couple of examples then. This is where many primary schools start with French. My examples this morning are in French. Clearly, these three questions and answers are useful and may be where we would want pupils. Uh, th these are maybe phrases that we want pupils to know. But if we for a moment unpack these, we'll see that starting a curriculum here is not necessarily the most helpful for learners at the very beginning of their journey. So for those of you um, who may not be specialists, comment tu t'appelles, je m'appelle Corey, uh, what you called, I'm called Corey, quel âge as-tu, how old are you, uh, j'ai 11 ans, I'm 11. Est-ce que tu as des frères ou des sœurs? Have you got brothers and sisters? J'ai un frère, I've got a brother. Let me give you a moment to look at those three French questions and answers and the questions below. What components are reusable that, is, that are being taught there? Uh, and, and those of you who are not linguists and struggled at school, at school may look at this and start to piece together why you may, um, may have struggled at school. Why are there issues in starting with these three questions? So if we start with the first question, comment tu t'appelles? Comment means how rather than what. 
in what is your name or what are you called? And therefore, from the very beginning, pupils might start to think that comment means what, and it means how. S'appeler, the verb that's used there, is a reflexive verb. It is not a reflexive verb in English, unless we use phrases like what you call yourself. So what are pupils going to think about at the very beginning of their journey in languages, the additional T and the additional M in those two phrases? If we look at the second question, quel means uh, which rather than how, as in how old are you? So from the beginning, pupils may start to think that quel means how rather than which. And you know yourselves that the verb that is used in French um, is to have rather than to be. So will pupils be confused from the very start about how to say I am and I have? I know we explain that in classrooms, but these are fundamental words in learning a language and, and cannot, cannot, be, cannot, cannot be mixed up. And at the end of that, j'ai onze ans, do pupils even by the end of 11 know that on is actually a plural form of the word for year, which is just an. And by adding the third question, do you have any brothers or sisters? In three questions, the curriculum plan has used the three different structures for asking a question. A question word in the first example, comment tu t'appelles, comment is the question word. The second example has inversion, um, instead of tu as, a tu, you can see that. And the third question has, um, as in English linguistics, dummy do, it's esque at the front of the sentence that will trigger a yes or no answer. I understand why people often start with these three questions. However, it's clearly potentially confusing. The only real components that can be reused are je and tu. Potentially the three ways to make a question may be a focus, but I'm fairly convinced that that wasn't really the basis upon which colleagues choose these three questions. It does raise the question for curriculum leaders. What is pre-learned as huge chunks of rehearsed question and answer exchanges? And that's fine in some respects, but if pupils never get to the point of being able to generate their own language, they will just end up learning longer and longer chunks of language, putting them together like GCSE presentations, and perhaps even just learning it as one huge long word without understanding what it means or being able to ever generate their own language. So what on earth what might, might you do? So consider this as a step-by-step -step approach, but at the very beginning of language learning. All the adjectives here are taken from Mr. Men and Little Miss books. So you can see here on the left, describe your personality. Décris ta personnalité. Very direct word-for-word -word translation. Step one, I am, je suis. Note the choice of adjectives in purple. We have there mean, bossy, odd or funny, and shy. These adjectives do not change whether the person is male or female. They are the same whether they are male or female. Step one. Step two, when we move on to describing other people, the third person, il est, elle est, again, word for word translation to understand what they mean. And then we're adding an e for the female, and it changed the sound in both of those circumstances. Il est bavard, elle est bavarde, il est maladroit, elle est maladroite. Both of them change the sound. And notice step three, we can see also that I've got some words in um, purple there at the bottom. They do add an E, but they don't change the pronunciation. We have their stubborn and busy. Since they do not change the pronunciation, this is potentially another step, which if thought about clearly, could be that step-by-step -step approach. If I give one further example, a third example, which I'll work through with you. If you've spent any time in a languages classroom in primary, uh, pets and their colors will not be unfamiliar to you. So if we use this as an example of a curriculum plan or the words and structures that need to be covered um, in, in that particular school, so we have the nouns on the left hand side, uh, male and female as indicated, uh, to check your French if you look down and let's see if you, if you know what all the words mean. Dog, cat, rabbit, mouse, guinea pig, tortoise, horse, snake, fish, 
And then this scheme of work has added uh, spider, araignée, and pool hen, possibly because there's not many female words, uh, female nouns for pets in French. Adjectives in the middle there, big, small, and you'll recognize blue, um, blue, green, red, yellow, brown, pink, white, and orange. And the phrases on the right hand side, have you any pets, have you an animal? Yes, I have a male and female foot forms for a, and no, I don't have a pet. If we were to look at these words and these pieces of language, how are we going to sequence the learning? What needs to be explained in a step-by-step -step approach for pupils within this part of the scheme of work? This is certainly not one lesson's worth in primary. There is an awful lot to cover here. So step one, potentially, um, introducing the nouns via gender. J'ai un chien, j'ai une tortue. And that would explain to learners that there are two, that there are two uh, genders in French. Notice underneath that, um, the second point there, many of the nouns for pets in French have the sound sh, and that is of phonological interest. Cochon d'Inde, chien, chat, cheval. It may be a natural opportunity to practice this sound spelling link in French and to ensure that phonics builds step by step within the, within the languages space. Adjectives in French, you may know that colours come after the noun and sizes before. So we have two different steps there that we could unpack. J'ai un chien noir, I've got, um, I've got a dog black. J'ai un grand chien, I've got a big dog. Putting those together, j'ai un grand chien noir, I've got a big dog black, I've got a big black dog. So you can see how that can be um, uh, broken down into, into clear steps. And the final step, colour adjectives for female nouns, could be hidden initially in order to explain to learners that colours come after the noun. So in one step, j'ai un chien rouge, I've got a red dog, j'ai une tortue rouge, I've got a red tortoise. Notice that the word rouge isn't changing, but we can focus on the fact that rouge is coming after the noun. And the next step might be some of those um, adjectives that change. Uh, j'ai un chien vert, j'ai une tortue verte. It always interests me that many, in many instances, we use colours to explain the fact that one adds an e um, if uh, an e to the adjective is if the noun is female. And in actual fact, many of the words for colours are irregular. So potentially, again, starting with the words that I've chosen from the Mr. Men books, which are very regular, is a better place to start because it's difficult to explain that you add an e um, when the noun is when the um, noun is female when in actual fact for colours that only actually happens. 50% of the time. So I've talked uh, about a step-by-step -step approach in languages that is fairly explicit about how the language works. You can hopefully see that the language covered in my second two examples, uh, that that is potentially much more accessible than the three questions about name, age, and family. Teaching in this way, pupils will hopefully have a deeper understanding about language in the second two examples. I think you'll agree. On me, just a final comment about uh, the most important knowledge and highlighting this and making sure that curriculum plans return to this again and again. And if we think of the pillar of vocabulary that, that I've outlined um, presently, I would hope that in languages that there is an explicit understanding that some words are more useful than others. I wouldn't want pupils leaving primary school with just a list of nouns that could only be used in certain circumstances. However, much inspection evidence shows that many pupils leave primary without knowing uh, simple high frequency words, being able to say, I am, I have, and, but, he, she, and so on. They can say their name and their age, but they don't actually know how they did it. And they do know the words for things like guinea pig and rabbit, but they can't put together um, even the simplest of sentences often. I would expect curriculum plans to highlight the most important pieces of vocabulary, high frequency verbs, for example, and return to these often and explicitly so that pupils can start to generate their own language. And a word on transition. 
Many colleagues in languages are focused on this. And you may know that we inspected individual subjects within some outstanding primary schools last year. And there's a blog about our findings on the Ofsted website uh, for this. You may not be surprised that there is quite a lot of variation in provision and quality of curriculum uh, in, in languages. However, I do make some comments as to the lack of transition between primary and secondary in relation to languages. Clearly, this is not a simple issue given uh, the number of partner primaries that secondary schools take from and the potential for the actual language being studied to be different. However, clearly it would be useful if secondary schools know what the component pieces of knowledge that have been covered. I often ask, what do you want to be left in the sieve when pupils arrive from year six into year seven? And my hope is that the answer is something along the lines of how to pronounce the language, how to make very simple sentences, and how to use simple verbs. That would be a greater use than a list of topic vocabulary, clothes and foods and so on. Sounds, high frequency words, and simple grammar. So progression in languages is up three pillars, phonics, grammar, and vocabulary. And it is the interplay of these pillars where most learning will be lying. A carefully sequenced curriculum with the most important linguist, linguistic features identified. Now let us hear about this a little in history. Thank you, Michael. And um, hopefully you can see my screen and the transitions work smoothly. I'm sure someone will stop me if that isn't the case. So I'm going to dive straight in and follow on from, from what Michael's shared there to, to think about what this might look like in history. And as we said at the beginning, one of the things that's, that's most interesting is that there are lots and lots of similarities across the two subjects and then also some really important differences that will emerge as I go through the session. But as Michael really helpfully explored there for languages, this focus on components, on identifying the building blocks of what we ultimately want pupils to know and be able to do, often brings great clarity to our thinking about curriculum design. And this absolutely applies in history as well. We see in schools that very often it's the schools that have thought about what building blocks sit behind some of the broader aims of the curriculum that have been able to build curriculums that really develop pupils knowledge and understanding over time whereas if schools focus too heavily on the broad composites the big broad aims like getting pupils to write historical accounts or arguments or coming up with their own interpretations although these are absolutely the right aims across a history curriculum Without thinking very carefully about the building blocks that sit behind these, it's often really hard for schools and particularly for class teachers to know what they should actually be teaching or emphasising at a particular moment. And so this thinking about what should be left in the sieve applies just as um, appropriately to history in primary schools as it does to languages. To take a very simple example, if we've got a curriculum where we um, want pupils to progress towards writing their own historical accounts. And by historical, we probably mean accounts that have some of the features of historical writing. So not just a good narrative, but exploring causal links or displaying forms of historical analysis. We do want pupils to move towards be able, being able to do something like this through the curriculum. But if our aim is explicitly and only on that disciplinary knowledge or that historical skill, what we often miss is the knowledge of the actual historical context that pupils need to be able to do that well. So if you had two pupils writing historical accounts about a topic like the spread of Christianity in the Anglo-Saxon period, the main difference between the quality of a really good account and a not so good account wouldn't be pupils skill or understanding of how to write a historical account it would most often be their actual knowledge of the period of Anglo-Saxon England and of the spread of Christianity, including some of those ideas that I've identified on the slide there. It's knowledge of the past that pupils need in order to shape their historical accounts. So this is one example of where it becomes really important to see what building blocks sit behind the broad aims that we have for pupils, including what actual knowledge of the past they will need to be able to do things like write historical accounts successfully. 
Now we're going to explore this Anglo-Saxon example in a bit more detail to look at how this might actually work in terms of the way that pupils make progress through a history curriculum. And if we imagine going back to the start of a Saxon's topic, let's say in year five for the sake of argument, and introducing pupils to the Saxons in an introductory lesson, maybe by saying something like the Saxons are many different groups who invaded England in the fifth and sixth centuries from Northern Europe. There were warriors and they took power where Romans had left creating kingdoms in England. What becomes apparent very quickly is that the most important factor in pupils making progress at this moment in the curriculum is all about the knowledge and understanding they already have. Their prior knowledge, particularly of some really important concepts, is what's going to determine how much they learn from this moment in the curriculum and therefore how much progress they make in terms of building up their knowledge of the Saxons and therefore building towards some of these broader composite aims. Because pupils who've got secure knowledge of concepts like invasion, taking power and kingdom with rich associations for each of those concepts will be able to make sense of this rather complex passage. But pupils who are lacking, first of all, knowledge of the Saxons who are being introduced, but also knowledge of some of these key concepts like invasion will miss the crucial meaning of what they are being told and therefore won't learn what they need to learn about the Saxons. And obviously the more of knowledge of these concepts that pupils are lacking, the less likely they are to learn this new knowledge about the Saxons. And that will then explain gaps in progress between those pupils, pupils who will develop secure knowledge of the Saxons and go on to write really brilliant historical accounts. And those pupils that will, even from the beginning of a topic, not secure the knowledge they need about the Saxons to set the context for everything else they're going to learn in that topic. And in fact, the impact of those gaps is even more significant than just pupil's knowledge of the Saxons. Because this is not just an opportunity for pupils to learn about the Saxons, but it is also an opportunity, as much of the history content is, for pupils to further develop the knowledge of those concepts that will then in turn be even more important to accessing material in the future. So for a pupil who understands this passage, not only will they learn about the Saxons, but they'll also develop their understanding of concepts like invasion, warriors, taking power and kingdoms. Now, the way this works is actually quite hopeful because we can start to, to worry about how we'd ever get to the point where pupils can understand anything we need to tell them in history. But actually, we know that pupils only need a very small amount of understanding of some of these concepts, particularly earlier on in their education, to access the next part of the curriculum and then continue on that journey to increasing complexity um, and sophistication in their knowledge. So a pupil who doesn't have an idea of what invasion means will obviously really struggle in this part of the lesson. But if we imagine a pupil that has encountered the concept of invasion before, Maybe just incidentally, maybe they've heard it in something that they were told or that they had read to them. But from that, they've developed a very basic concept of invasion. They've associated just one idea with it. And it's not perfect and it's not wholly accurate, but it is a relevant idea in their concept of invasion, which is this idea that invasion is a process where people come from one country to another country. Now, we know because we've got more refined and sophisticated concepts for invasion that that doesn't really capture the full meaning, but it does have a huge impact on pupils ability to access this part of the curriculum. Because this pupil, even though they've got only a basic concept of invasion, will understand that the Saxons were groups who came from other countries in northern Europe to England which gives them a way into the key meaning of this passage, seeing the Saxons as groups that come from other places to England in the fifth and sixth century. But most importantly, because of what comes next in what pupils learn, because they learn about how the Saxons came from one country to England and what they did, and they see that this is associated with this idea of invasion, they actually start to develop their concept of invasion as well as their knowledge of Saxons. So these pupils might add into their kind of concept schema for invasion, other ideas like invasion involves fighting or war, or it's about taking power, or even just that it's not just visiting a place, but is coming to stay. These are crucial steps 
in pupils building a concept of invasion that's really sophisticated and allows them to access more and more complex ideas and um, historical content moving forward. So even just a very small amount of knowledge of some of these concepts can be transformative in terms of what pupils are able to learn in the curriculum. And what happens for those pupils that are on that journey through our curriculum is that this concept continues to develop throughout time. When they go on to learn about the Vikings, say, in their next topic, then they've already got this rich understanding of what invasion means, which can be built on because they're not having to plug gaps in understanding. And instead, new ideas are also associated with invasion that make it even more sophisticated. So they start to understand the impact of invasion in coastal areas, for example, or the unique geography of the British Isles and how, how that affects its um, likelihood of invasions. These are really sophisticated, complex and specific ideas that are building up a really, really powerful unit of understanding in terms of what pupils make sense of when they hear this term invasion in future learning. So it's a bit crude, but one way we can conceptualise pupils progress throughout the curriculum is that their knowledge and understanding of concepts like invasion, which come up regularly in history, becomes more secure, more able to be quickly retrieved and more confidently known, but also more sophisticated. It incorporates more and more complex and sophisticated ideas over time. So the security and sophistication of people's concept knowledge grows over time. And as they start to develop more and more complex understanding of these concepts, so they can quickly access much more complex information in history where these concepts are being used in complex scenarios. Now that helps us to think about, akin to Michael's pillars of progression, some areas of the history curriculum that might be particularly important for supporting pupils to go on and continue to make progress by learning more history. So these substantive concepts, these key concepts like invasion, empire, trade, tax, king, are one area where we know pupils' knowledge is really important in them accessing the curriculum later on. Another area that we know is really important is pupils' chronological knowledge or their knowledge of an understanding of the past in overview, but also the specific features and broad characteristics of particular periods. So is a really crude characterization, we can consider pupils building up this sort of mental timeline as they go through the history curriculum, which includes some particular dates or events that they might know about, some broad periods that they've got a sense of, hopefully ordered well in their minds so they can understand how developments lead on to each other. But then also crucially, some general features and characteristics of particular periods, like for example, the importance of the church in the medieval period or the importance of monasteries or the role of farming in the economy. Now, all of these broad features that pupils learn through what they've already studied in the medieval period are another way, like their knowledge of concepts, that pupils are able to access more complex information because when they learn about their next topic in the medieval period, they've already got an understanding of, for example, the role of farming in the economy that allows them to understand lots of other things they're going to be taught about this period. So these two aspects of pupils' historical knowledge are particularly important in supporting pupils' progress through the curriculum, knowledge of concepts like invasion and their chronological knowledge, their knowledge of the broad sweeps of the past, but also of the broader features and characteristics of periods. And we see brilliant work in schools very often where these things are given particular emphasis and prioritized in the curriculum. And pupils' knowledge of these is built carefully over time. However, in history, and this is where some of the differences can emerge between the approaches that work best in subjects like history and subjects like languages. In history, it isn't necessarily appropriate for us to focus too heavily on these elements, even though we know they are crucial to supporting progress. There's a couple of reasons for that that I want to explore in a bit more detail because they're crucial for understanding the way that your school might have constructed its history curriculum to support progress for all pupils. So the question really is, if these are so important, why can't we just create a list of 
10, 20, 30 really, really key concepts we want every pupil in year four to know, and then teach them definitions of those concepts and continually test them until they are fluent in those definitions, plus some key chronological knowledge, maybe a timeline and a few facts about each period that we just teach pupils directly, test them on, secure their knowledge of until they are fluent. Now, the first reason is pretty straightforward, and that's that in history, there are just too many concepts that pupils need to build knowledge of at any one time for us to focus too heavily on any particular concept. So we know that invasion is really important to them understanding that passage on the Saxons, but then so was kingdom and taking power and knowledge of the fifth and sixth century. So there's loads just to access that bit. And it might be that soon after that description, we then move on to talking about the Anglo-Saxon church, in which case we've got a whole raft of other concepts they need to know. So what we can't do in history is focus on invasion until we've got it absolutely fluent and sophisticated in every pupil's minds before we ever teach them anything about the Anglo-Saxons. Because in doing that, we'll miss opportunities for them to learn about all of the other concepts they need to know as well. Just in the Anglo-Saxons, we might, and this is not even an exhaustive list, we might identify all of these concepts that are really important, really powerful, that we might want pupils to learn. We might be able to identify a few of them for specific emphasis. So we might make a real fuss of king and invasion and monastery and church, for example. But we have to allow pupils the opportunities to encounter some of these other concepts. You know, we might just mention tax or trade or navy in this topic. We might not give it explicit emphasis, but we know from the invasion example earlier that even a really early encounter with these concepts, just a basic understanding of what they might mean, can be the difference between a pupil accessing or not accessing later content. So we have to keep up the richness and the breadth of our history curriculum throughout to ensure that even though we might emphasize some particular knowledge, we also give pupils lots of opportunities to encounter all of these other concepts and ideas that will be important later on. The second reason is a little bit more complex and I want to unpack it in a bit more detail. And it's to do with the way that we actually learn concepts like invasion in history. And that is that we learn these complex or abstract ideas. If we think about invasion, it seems very simple to us as adults who are confident in the term, but actually it's a very abstract and complex idea what we mean by an invasion and how it's different to, for example, visiting a country. Those are really complex nuances. And we know that pupils learn these complex or abstract ideas best through repeated encounters, first of all. So that means rather than from a standing start with pupils knowing nothing about invasion, us trying to teach them all of those aspects of invasion that we want them to know, for example, by year seven. Instead, we learn best when we build up this conception knowledge slowly. So we've got a basic idea of invasion in year four and then in year five we come across it again and we build up a little bit more and we increasingly build up our sophistication over time. But the final part of that sentence is the most important which is that repeated encounters are crucial but these need to be repeated encounters with meaningful examples. Now what we mean by this is that in history this doesn't mean repeated encounters with definitions of these terms but rather with examples of how these are actually used in the description of the past and in the ways that historians construct accounts and communicate about historical events. So pupils need to actually learn about concepts like invasion through meaningful examples in actual historical context, not through abstract definitions. There's a few reasons for this that I'm going to explore. One of them is that the meaning of these is actually very period specific. So we want pupils to know about invasion to understand the Anglo-Saxons, but actually a definition doesn't quite cut it because our definition of invasion might be more skewed towards modern invasions. If you think about something like the D-Day landings and how different they are to, for example, what invasion means in the Anglo-Saxon period. There are huge differences between those things. And actually we need pupils to understand that period specific meaning of invasion. If they think of it as like other invasions or in a generic sense, then they'll misunderstand what is actually involved in invasion as a process in the Anglo-Saxon period. And even small misconceptions about the kinds of military technology available can actually make it impossible for pupils to understand why the Anglo-Saxon invasions happened the way they did. 
So the fact that these are period specific means that we need people to actually learn about Anglo-Saxon invasions to understand invasion in the medieval period, not just learn about generic definitions. The other reason is because we actually learn better and more securely when we learn these concepts, not through definitions, but through actual contexts. And I'm going to explore an example of this and how it might work in, in curriculum plans when looking at the concept of the church, which is absolutely crucial to pupils knowledge and understanding and if we think about our curriculum in terms of preparing pupils for the next stage and particularly in upper key stage two preparing them for secondary school history their knowledge of the church is an absolutely crucial component of them understanding some of the really complex ideas they're going to encounter in year seven history when they learn about for example conflicts between the monarchy and the church in medieval england or challenges to the church and its authority in the reformation Pupils need to have a really rich and sophisticated concept of church. Now, church is a good example because I think it's one where we might actually decide in our curriculum that we need to explicitly think about where and how we're going to build up pupils' knowledge and understanding of the church. We're not going to do it like we might in other subjects by focusing exclusively on the church or having lessons where we just teach pupils about definitions of the concept of church, but we might try to encourage our curriculum to allow pupils to have more opportunities to encounter knowledge about the church and ensure that we focus on this and prioritize it in teaching to really secure people's knowledge of the church. Now, the reason for that is because there tends to be quite a big gap between what pupils' concept of church is naturally in, say, year four, which maybe will include aspects like it being a, a religious building or an important building, and what they need to understand in say year seven, which largely comes down to these important ideas of the church as an institution, i.e. the church is this kind of complex organizational network across Europe. Pupils who understand the church as essentially a religious building or even as a series of religious buildings are really far away from the kind of concept knowledge they will need to access the way that year seven teachers are gonna talk about the church. So they need to understand this idea of there being networks of churches with a hierarchy, the role of different people within that hierarchy, this idea that the church has its doctrine and has controversies over doctrine and that there are periods of church reform in terms of the doctrine of the church. And these are hugely complex ideas. And obviously we might be thinking, well, I can't teach that to my year five pupils. But what we can do is in our curriculum, place ourselves on that journey towards pupils greater understanding in terms of the complexities and sophistication of the church. So what we might do with a concept like church is think right maybe there are some aspects of this that we can make sure that we teach pupils so that we are helping build their component this concept of church over time to help them access the later curriculum. So we might identify some ideas like for example churches are connected across Europe we could probably teach that to our pupils in year five. The churches are connected to each other. You know, people talk, they write letters to each other. And we might be able to teach pupils that there are periods of disagreement across the church. People have different ideas and they disagree about them. And these, if we can get this across to pupils in year five, then we're giving them a huge boost in this important area in terms of the sophistication of their concept of church so that they can access the later curriculum. But even once we identify these particular aspects of the concept that we want to teach pupils, we might start to think, well, how are we actually going to deliver these? These are still really abstract and complex ideas. It's fine to say to pupils that churches are connected across Europe, but what does that really mean? How far can pupils in year five understand what we mean when we talk about churches, these buildings, as far as they're concerned, being connected to each other? And what we do and what we see history teachers do brilliantly all the time and it's, I think this is a crucial aspect of effective history teaching that it's really important for leaders to understand in school so they can see what's happening because it's often very subtle and really, really sophisticated, is that we identify specific contexts and really meaningful examples through which to teach this crucial knowledge. So whereas in other subjects, we might focus exclusively on this that we want pupils to know, we're going to wipe away all distractions and just focus on teaching pupils that church is connected. In history, we paradoxically almost do the opposite. We use loads of other detail and richness and complexity from the past to introduce this idea to pupils. So we don't teach them explicitly about churches being connected across Europe. 
Instead, perhaps, we teach them about something like the Synod of Whitby in the seventh century, which for those of you who are non-specialists was a meeting of church leaders to try and determine the date for Easter that should be followed in the English church, essentially whether to follow the Irish date for Easter or the Roman date for Easter. Now, the key thing about the Synod of Whitby is it's as a specific event in the Anglo-Saxon period, it actually introduces pupils in a concrete way to some of those abstract ideas we want them to understand. Because rather than teaching pupils in the abstract about churches being connected across Europe, we can tell them about the specific things that happened in Whitby. We can tell them this narrative with all of its concrete and familiar elements. Pupils will understand this idea of people traveling a long way to come to Whitby to this big meeting. They understand this idea that pupils had different viewpoints and that they disagreed and agreed about different things and that there were these different personalities like the abbess of Whitby, Hilda, and that they each had their own influence. There are aspects of this that are much more familiar and meaningful to pupils. So teaching them the story of the Synod of Whitby is actually the best vehicle to teach them this really crucial knowledge in the middle, this idea of how churches are connected and that there are disagreements within the church. But rather than teaching them it in the abstract, we teach them a really specific, rich example. And it's all that richness that, unlike in some other subjects, is not actually a distraction. It's actually the very means by which we're going to teach pupils this crucial content in the middle. Now, I want to finish by just briefly talking a little bit about disciplinary knowledge um, or historical skills and understanding or thinking like a historian, it's defined in many different ways. Because actually some of the thinking about progression that we've already um, done is really helpful when we come to think about disciplinary knowledge as well. And if um, you've read the blog that we released on history teaching in outstanding primary schools, you might have noted that um, amongst huge strengths in primary teaching of history, one area that we did see more variability in and some weaker practice was in the way that schools approached progression in disciplinary knowledge. And going right back to the beginning of um, the history part of this talk, you remember I talked about this difference between the, the broad aims, like getting pupils to write accounts, and the specific building blocks that work towards it. And we do see schools where the curriculum only identifies these broad aims, but doesn't give clarity, particularly to class teachers, about what pupils actually need to know at different stages to build towards those broad aims. And often those broad aims are disciplinary. They're often related to the second order concepts in the national curriculum. So things like sources and evidence, cause and consequence, change and continuity, historical significance, et cetera. Now, pupils absolutely do need to develop their knowledge and understanding of those things across the curriculum. But crucially, those complex ideas about what historians do, how they study the past and construct their accounts, those are endpoints for the end of key stage three. So just like with a concept of invasion, we wouldn't expect pupils to have the finished article in year three or year five. With disciplinary knowledge, in terms of understanding, for example, how historians use sources, we also wouldn't expect pupils to be the finished article in year three or year five or year six. We are part, as, as primary teachers, of their journey towards understanding things like how historians use sources. And what we sometimes see in schools is well-meaning attempts by teachers to have pupils doing really complex things, like using a range of sources to construct their own arguments without really identifying exactly how that's going to help pupils build towards the kind of knowledge that will allow them to do that really well in say year nine in a secondary school. So disciplinary knowledge progression is in some ways no more complex than building pupils knowledge of, of ideas like invasion. Apart from there's even more complexity to the concepts that we're trying to build because pupils, for example, to build their knowledge of how historians use sources, need to know about not only some knowledge about sources and evidence and how historians use them, but they also need to know loads about whatever period or topic they encounter sources in. So if we give pupils a load of sources from the Anglo-Saxon period, for example, in the hope that they'll build their knowledge of how historians work with sources, they'll only be able to do that if they also know loads about the Anglo-Saxon period, loads about the actual historical context that allows them to make sense of those sources in the way that a historian would. 
And if we're trying to move pupils towards a broad aim, like using a range of sources to construct reasonable and rigorous historical arguments, it's worth thinking about where we might fit in terms of a journey of pupils towards that eventual broad aim, rather than expecting them to do that perfectly without support and teaching earlier on in their education in primary schools. Because actually what we tend to see is that because these ideas, the way that historians work with sources are so complex, they're really, really sophisticated, and historians of different periods of the past work with sources in different ways, that there's a big gap, but as represented by this red bar, between what pupils actually know about the period and also about how historians use sources, and then what they would need to know to be able to do this really well, to be able to really use sources effectively and historically to construct historical arguments. And what can sometimes happen is that we plug this gap, pupils plug this gap with misconceptions and everyday thinking. So if we give them a load of sources and say, you know, which of these are more or less reliable, they'll use everyday answers to that because they're lacking the knowledge of how historians work with sources. So they might say, oh, this one's more reliable because it was made at the time. Or they might say the complete opposite. This one's more reliable because it was made later on. And actually, neither of those are really correct representations of the way that historians work with sources. So we can plug this gap by allowing pupils to kind of build misconceptions and not challenging them because we want them to have a go themselves. But actually, if we don't challenge misconceptions like this, then we don't allow them to progress. We don't allow them to build the sophistication of their understanding of how historians use sources. And sometimes we as teachers can be guilty of actively encouraging this mis these misconceptions because we try and plug this gap through oversimplifications or generic approaches or distortions. For example, teaching pupils that primary sources are not reliable and secondary sources are or whatever it happens to be. But oversimplifications that actually create misconceptions that are really, really hard to undo and pupils tend to take all the way through to secondary school because what we're trying to do is give them a way of working with sources that they can understand. Now that's perfectly possible but we do need to be careful when we do that that we are actually building people's knowledge and understanding of how historians use sources as we go not simply giving them an opportunity to play around with sources without being taught what they need to to do that well. I'll give you one brief example of, of what this could look like um, if it's not done well which is an activity like this, for example, though well-meaning, is really likely to build misconceptions for pupils. Because if we give pupils a question like, which source do you think is most reliable? Instantly, we actually create the misconception that sources have an inherent reliability, i.e. source one is either reliable or not, and source two is either reliable or not. And actually in history, sources are reliable or useful for different, you know, for different questions. So a source might be particularly useful for answering one question, but not so useful for answering another. Sources don't themselves have an innate reliability that we can label them with. There are lots of other issues with this activity. It uses sources of very short extracts, which can confuse pupils in terms of what sources actually are. They kind of tend to think of these, these like neatly prepackaged bits of writing about the past in a sentence or so that tell us exactly what we need them to say. They tend to think that sources either agree or disagree with a particular point because we select extracts that do that. So they don't really understand what it means for a historian to interpret a source because the sources they see either simply are a yes or no in terms of a question. We've also got a misconception here in terms of source two being a source, even though it's written after the events it describes, which actually means it's an interpretation, which is quite an important distinction for pupils to understand. So what we can do if we if we give pupils activities like this, which are an attempt to try and get them better at thinking about sources, unfortunately, we can end up building misconceptions into their concept of how historians use sources. So for example, that sources are short extracts, that they are reliable or not. A really damaging one, which is that if a source says something unlikely or untrue, then that source becomes unreliable. The first source from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle talks about dragons flying across the sky just before the Viking invasions. But no historian worth their salt would ever dismiss that source because of that description. They would know how to work with um, that part of the source. They Another one that comes up quite often is this idea that there's no wrong answers, you just pick one in history. Um, although it's true that there are many right answers in history and historians construct their different accounts and different interpretations, there are 
valid and reasonable ways of working with sources and we don't want to encourage people to think that history is just a free-for-all you just pick anything and you back it up because that actually devalues the processes that we want pupils to learn about so what we need to do instead is think just like we would with a concept like church how can our curriculum support people on the same sort of journey how can it build up the security and sophistication of their knowledge about for example sources over time and actually what this might involve us doing is yes of course giving pupils opportunities to work with sources and to experiment with the ways that historians operate but we just need to make sure that we also teach pupils increasingly complex knowledge and understanding of these ideas if we just leave it to chance and just let them work with sources in year five and they have another go working with sources in year six then we're not supporting progress unless we are actually giving pupils more knowledge and understanding each time of how historians work with sources so what this might look like in really simple terms um and it's just an example this isn't a curriculum plan at all but it might be that the work we do in say year one to secure pupils knowledge of the past and of chronological time but also even quite random aspects of their learning you know they learn about something like a diary which isn't part of the history curriculum but these can be important building blocks that they build on later we're certainly not expecting to see pupils working with sources directly in year one and even when we go into year three and pupils are in key stage two it's not necessarily the case although we may well want pupils to work with sources we're not expecting them to be independently constructing accounts from sources like we might in year nine this is just another stage on the journey so maybe all we do in year three maybe we teach about the egyptians and we might help them understand that sources are things that survive from the past and historians use them to find out about the past again through a meaningful context like with the synod of whitby maybe we learn about howard carter and tutankhamun's tomb and we learn about how historians try and piece together what happened in the past from sources which survive from the past and then in year five we can start to build on this knowledge with more complex ideas like there are different kinds of sources when we learn about the anglo-saxons archaeological sources and written sources like diaries and there is some knowledge from year one that might actually just gently support what we learn about in year five that these sources can answer different kinds of questions so if i want to know about the kind of places people lived in i'd look at archaeological evidence um if i want to know about things like battles or invasions i might look at the chronicles or the written evidence from the period and actually that is starting to build us up some really complex ideas about how historians use sources that people simply didn't understand before and if we'd have just given them some sources to work with without that knowledge they actually wouldn't have had the kind of tools they'd need to really start to answer historical questions from evidence and then this supports transition because we're allowing pupils to then in year seven build upon this foundation that we've created to start to understand really complex ideas about the discipline of history historians might disagree about how sources are interpreted they might have different research interests and that might affect their view or even the types of sources that they look at and on and on to even greater complexity about how historians give weight to particular sources and particular evidence and accounts so we can be part of this this journey of pupils just like with a concept like church by identifying what are the actual building blocks that we can create in our curriculum to help pupils to build more sophisticated knowledge and understanding over time i'm going to hand back to michael now who's going to really helpfully draw out from what we've both said some of the ideas that are, con that are consistent across the two subjects of which there are many but some of the things that you'll have picked up from from what i've said where there are some slight differences in terms of the way we might want to think about curriculum and progression in these two subjects over to you michael great thanks so let us consider some of the common principles um, behind the two subjects so in all subjects breaking down composites um, is a crucial part of effectively planning for progression particularly with younger and novice pupils. They need to secure knowledge of key components. So in languages, what the links are between the sounds and the spelling of the language, words and some of their grammatical information, so gender and how the words alter according to their position in the sentence, for example, and grammar, simple grammatical concepts, how words join together to make sentences and join together to make questions to create meaning. Clearly at a basic level in the primary classroom, but it's important that pupils bring this knowledge together. Because of course, pupils cannot simply start 
uh, with the composite by starting by producing paragraphs, starting by generating conversations. They need clearly the components in which uh, to be able to do this. And in history, pupils writing an essay, giving an argument, actually require lots of component knowledge about the specific topic. So for example, if it is, why did Christianity spread in Anglo-Saxon England? Then lots of knowledge of Anglo-Saxon England is needed. And this is much more important than the knowledge of how to write an essay. If curriculum plans only identify the broad composites, it may be hard for class teachers, especially non-specialists, to know what to teach and what to emphasize in lessons and what to assess to ensure that pupils are ultimately able to reach that composite. So to take away, we need to ensure that curriculum plans identify the component knowledge which pupils need to achieve, need, in order to achieve ambitious and broad end goals. And of course, it's important uh, to emphasize and prioritize uh, content within topics and contexts. So linked to this, curriculum plans do need to go beyond topics. Topics are just areas of content. They aren't the same as knowledge that pupils most need. This is what curriculum intent needs to cover. What knowledge it is, is it that is particularly important for pupils to learn? So in our history example, we are studying Anglo-Saxon England and the Synod of Whitby. Obviously, we do want pupils to learn about these things, but their knowledge of the Synod of Whitby itself isn't crucial what will, for what they'll go on to learn. It is other knowledge that they'll develop through studying the Synod of Whitby. So, for example, the knowledge of the structure of the church, the role of monasteries, and so on. And in languages, it's around identifying the most important pieces of language. That is the language that will help pupils to generate their own sentences and say what they want to say. So phrases and vocabulary like I am, I have, sometimes and so on. These can be used to help build sentences, whereas certain nouns, guinea pig, dog, cat and so on can only be used in certain circumstances. Of course, nouns are needed. Um, I'm clearly not saying that they're not, but in as far as emphasis and priority is, co is concerned, high frequency words and simple grammar are more important. So to take away, we need to ensure that curriculum plans go beyond topic level and make clear exactly what knowledge needs to be prioritized or emphasized by teachers. And we know that pupils learn by making connections. They build schemata or knowledge webs as they associate new ideas with their existing knowledge. When pupils encounter concepts and content repeatedly, their knowledge of these becomes more secure. Encountering these concepts in different contexts also means that pupils refine and develop these schemata, making them more sophisticated. In languages, eventually, when moving from novice to expert learner, learners can spot patterns and similarities. They can extend their knowledge. But for most of the time in classrooms, however, teachers will be directive in the language that's being taught. However, using different tenses in different topics or different themes allow pupils to embed these uh, in their webs of knowledge in their schemata. And in history, pupils might first come across the concept of church in a story or in a play. They will start to develop an early schema for the concept of church. It's a building. And as they encounter church in new and more complex contexts, this will be refined. It's an important building. It's to do with religion. And eventually much more complex. That is, there's a network of churches. It's an organization across Europe. There's a role for archbishops and the like. So to take away, we need to plan for repeated encounters with, encounters with important concepts. We need to assess people's knowledge of these and we need to move pupils beyond simple, straightforward definitions. However, there are some crucial areas where the differences between subjects are also important. The crucial one is that in subjects like languages, each step in learning builds very directly on what the pupils have already done. So in languages, teaching needs to be explicit and direct so that pupils understand the component features and are secure in them. And it is crucial that learners are secure before moving on. Too often, teachers move through the scheme of work 
and more and more attrition is seen. So soon, some pupils have not grasped the basics and the Jenga tower of learning, that step-by-step -step edifice starts to, collect, to collapse. A step-by-step -step approach with each part and building on the last. Whereas in history, pupils are building their knowledge of lots of different concepts at the same time. We can't stop and focus just on one single concept like church because they're also learning about priests, transport kings, and, and so on at the same time. If we take away all of these other details about the period, pupils will actually be less able to make sense of a concept like church because it will become too abstract. They need to learn uh, real examples of how the church worked, like the Synod of Whitby, and then to return to this concept next time. And when they return to this concept next time, uh, they will encounter it in another rich context. If we teach, if we only teach a definition of church, they will never capture the complexity that we do need pupils to understand. So across the course of the morning, we've aimed uh, to build on the principles of curriculum design and sequencing that have been covered in previous webinars. And we've exemplified these in two different subjects, uh, languages and history. And we've looked at the common principles uh, and some of the slight differences between these two subjects. Kate. Thank you very much, Michael and Tim. Um, now, there have been some questions coming in. We had a couple beforehand and some that have come in throughout the session. So um, I'm going to direct the first one to you, Michael, if that's OK. Um, the question here is, do Ofsted expect primary academies to be teaching a modern foreign language? Some schools historically dropped modern foreign language when they converted to academies. And that's a, a very good question. Um, we know that all pupils in maintained schools are expected to study the basic curriculum, and clearly that's the national curriculum, RE and age-appropriate relationships and sex education. And we know that academies are expected to offer all pupils a broad curriculum that should be similar in breadth and ambition. And clearly also um, uh, the curriculum needs to promote uh, spiritual, moral, social, cultural development of pupils at school. Now, in as far as being similar in breadth of ambition, and, and given the DfE's focus on an academic core at Key Stage 4, there are some aspects of the programme of study in languages that it would be difficult to mirror without studying a language. So um, understanding basic grammar appropriate to the language being studied, speaking in sentences using familiar vocabulary and developing accurate pronunciation and so on. It seems difficult that a school could mirror that as far as ambition is concerned without studying a language. Um, however, Arguably, it's, it, it may not be impossible, but I think it would be unusual. Thank you. Really helpful. Um, there is another question for you, Michael, about languages. Um, this one is, is there a logical way to teach um, with, um, so, for example, with a focus on a use of high frequency words, etc. And therefore, why are we simply not given these rather than each school trying to identify which will what will end up being very similar? So I think I know where you might head here in the fact that we don't we don't set the national curriculum at Ofsted, do we? But I'll, I'll hand to you. No, we don't set the national curriculum at Ofsted, but there are many lists that have been published around the most common hundred words in a language, the most common thousand words in a language that may help uh, may help focus on this. Um, I suppose it's about it's about the pendulum. Um, we cannot only have high frequency words in a language when we're speaking. We need nouns. We do need a context. It's, it's about where the emphasis is placed within the primary curriculum, because if pupils are leaving year six with only the nouns and none of the structures, um, then, then that is less useful for transition and yes, less useful for progression. But they do exist um, lists of, of high frequency words in any language, uh, although we do not um, prescribe which those uh, lists are, that they clearly, they clearly exist. A really good practical question, actually, and I think we're all for that in teaching, aren't we? Actually, if there's something out there and somebody's done it beforehand, to, to share resources and, and use those. Thank you, Michael. Um, this isn't um, particularly related to one subject or another, but it's about um, planning the curriculum across changing mixed age classes. And actually, this is a question that we get asked a lot of the time. So, for example, a school that may have a year two, three combined class one year and then a year three, four the next. Um, how can schools plan um, so that they do not repeat content? Um, so I know I'm having this conversation regularly in schools and, and it is a, a challenge for schools in how they deliver that curriculum. But it is up to schools 
hospitals how they do that. And actually, from our point of view in Ofsted, we don't have a prescribed way of doing this or certainly not a set expectation about how you should run that for different year group scenarios. Um, when we um, went out to pilot these types of inspection under the education inspection framework, we were really careful to pilot it in really big schools and really small um, village schools, perhaps, you know, with 30 or 40 pupils. So it can apply to all. What we look at is the intent leaders have um, that's specific to their school. So how they've planned that curriculum in the context that they have. And then we'd want to know, given that context, how they were ensuring the most important content is taught practiced and remembered and very simply whether pupils have the knowledge intended by the end of each phase or the end of their time in school for example it's really helpful thank you um, and actually I, I think it's great to have seen some questions coming in this morning because when we hear messages um, you you take time to reflect on them don't you and actually then want to ask lots more questions in relation to them so I think that that just highlights for me that we will I think have a catch-up session so although we've got five webinars um, we are looking at doing a, a general question and answer session so that once you've really reflected on the content of what we've shared in these sessions if there are particular things that you would like to ask us um, we're really happy to organize event where an event where we can come back and, and do just that because we don't want to leave you with lots of unanswered questions Questions. We this, these really are um, to be supportive to you in planning your effective curriculums in your school. I think we've, we've covered most of the things in the chat bar today, so it just remains for me to say a huge thank you, um, particularly to Michael and Tim today um, for, for your work, and also to Andrew in the background, who's kept things running smoothly for us. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the fifth session in a couple of weeks' time, where Michael and Tim will have a closer look at the secondary curriculum in history and languages. Thank you very much, everyone. See you soon. Bye-bye.